Uh, I've been caving since uh, the mid 80s, actually mid 70s. Uh, I used to uh, actually live down in Washington DC and I was a scuba diver. Uh, my dive club used to dive off the wrecks of North Carolina like every other weekend, which is only a nine or 10 hour drive away. And once or twice a year, we would camp in inland Florida. And that's where I was introduced to the uh, underwater caves. Um, then eventually I moved back to New York and those trips were just too long and I stopped cave diving and they became what's called a dry cave, basically coming out of the water. And since I've lost six associates in the last 30 years who ended up making a, a take, having a, a problem diving and they lost their lives, I think the reason I'm still here is I did it in reverse. I got the diving out of the way first. Because uh, there's a saying in cave diving, um, there are no second chances. You become a statistic. So in dry caving, there, there was a second chance. And my last serious cave dive was in 96 when a Russian diver friend and I decided we got a second chance. So that's when I came out of the water. Um, am I running? Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll do a little song and dance. Okay. Uh, all right. So... Um, I'll do, tell you a little bit about, about uh, the beginning. I happened to be in Coney Island in uh, 1993, a place called Little Odessa, where practically every Ukrainian-American and Russian-American has passed through. It's known as Little Odessa, Coney Island. I ran into a visiting Ukrainian caver named Valeria Kozhnikov. He was here for six months. We came, became the best of friends. In fact, today, him and his family live in Saratoga, Sarasota, Florida, and I'm the godfather of his grandson. Well, when Valeri went back to Ukraine, he said, you should come uh, visit my wife and I, and we'll take you to the famous giant ships and caves. And geologists all over the world have heard about these uh, caves. Well, Valeri didn't know what it was like to invite a New Yorker for free room and board, so I've been going back every year since. <laughs> so, okay, now we're set. I'm a New Yorker, but my passion is exploring caves. I was in Ukraine when I stumbled over some objects. Those objects were someone's life. Western Ukraine was one of the worst places for Jews during the war. We were hiding and Father says, Nissel, you gotta find a place. We cannot live like this. 38 of us descended into the cave. We got down and we started sliding in. <gasps> My God, I've got a playground here. No human being had ever set foot there. We came there almost without food. A glass of water was for a family. We were very hungry. All of a sudden, we hear shooting. Oh. 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 And My mother said that kids hide any place you can. Everybody started to run in different directions. They took my mother away. I'll never see her again. The Russians, the Germans, who knows what's outside? The villagers came with the shovels and they filled up the hall. People are screaming, open up the exit, open up the exit, but they can't do it. Three days and three nights, we were working, everybody. And I look up when I see a star. One day I come out, there is this. And we were liberated. Everybody was crying. They survived underground for over a year and a half. I forgot that there was a sun. Here I am! Bang! I wanted to say thank you to the cave. I felt like I'm going back in time. We beat the odds. The cave was fighting for me. They didn't get us. We didn't tell it to others because it was just too incredible. Let's close all the lights for a minute. Ah, no, I feel good. All right, now that you saw the final product, let me tell you how we got here. And it all started about 20 years ago. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was lucky enough to get an invitation to go to Western Ukraine 
to visit the famous gypsum caves. These are some of the longest caves in the world. And uh, the story be began in that area encircled in red. Um, many uh, people know that area, especially people of Ukrainian and Russian heritage, as uh, Galicia. It's now southwestern Ukraine, but it's an area that's been owned by the Austro-Hungarians, uh, Poland, Ukraine, and uh, Russia. No natural boundaries. While I was walking through the cave, um, I soon started to come across artifacts in a little section of the cave. Now for the non-cavers, that map on the right is looking down into that cave. Today that cave has been measured to be over 86 miles long. There was a little area encircled by a little red rectangle that had all types of artifacts in there. Uh, I could tell these weren't artifacts in, in terms of being hundreds of years old. They were contemporary. They, they looked to be maybe 20, 30, maybe even 60, 70 years old. Found remains of a stove, found a millstone in the cave. By the way, the blue light is a flash. Uh, there's no sunlight down here. To use uh, one of the, uh, some of the words of the survivors, down there, it's black and then black, dark and then dark. No starlight, no moonlight. That's an electronic flash. Found all types of buttons. Uh, we found uh, a lot of shoes, cups, uh, pottery shards. Uh, years later, we find out the uh, pottery shards were very interesting when we were digging in different parts of the cave because it turns out that when I was interviewing 12 of the original 38 people that survived what I'm going to tell you about, uh, I found out that each of the five families had a unique pattern on their china. So now, even today, when we dig up something, by looking at the closest pottery charge nearby, we know which of five families' campsites we, we were digging into. So I was uh, captivated. Uh, I just started to get fascinated. I had a mystery. But there were a number of hurdles I, I faced. This is the early 90s. Number one, I'm a foreigner. Number two, uh, I didn't speak Russian. I didn't speak Ukrainian. And with the exception of some of the local cavers that were engineering majors that spoke English, there was a translation problem. Of course, I've been going there for 20 years now. Now the solution's easy. It's just vodka. Well, we, <laughs> you drink enough that we all speak each other's language fluently. But I didn't know that back in the early 90s. Um, so there were problems. I was a foreigner. Uh, people were hesitant to talk to uh, an American, somebody from the West. Uh, local villagers would... Uh, close their doors and uh, peek behind shades at me, and one of the curators of a local museum said, it's not because you're an American, it's because you may be a Jewish American who's come back there to reclaim property taken during the war. Um, in the US, when you ask an old people, an old person, where were you born, it's, it's a simple answer question scenario. Not so over there after 70 years of communist rule. Because one of the first things I want to do is I want to find old people in the area, thinking perhaps they would have some information, because the local cavers knew nothing about these artifacts. All I was getting from some of the old farmers in the 70s and 80s is perhaps some Jews lived there during the Holocaust, but nothing else. So I started to look for elderly people, uh, but no such luck of finding anyone that had memories of that area. Because even if I was finding people in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s, it doesn't mean they spent any major portion of their life there. Because under Stalin, he split up entire families and shipped them all over the Soviet Union. So in most cases, if you, if you did find an elderly person, they could have been born in Kazakhstan or some part of Mongolia, but not there. And when I would be lucky enough to find some elderly people there, there was a problem of selective memory. In one case, I interviewed a man that was 104. He told me what it was like during the Russian Revolution, the First World War, the Second World War, but he had no memory of what happened to the Jews who lived 1,000 feet away from him. Some of my friends, local cavers, were Jewish cavers. And I asked them years later, I said, you knew I was trying to get information about this story. How come you didn't mention anything about it? Mind you, they didn't have much to offer other than what some of the farmers did, meaning it was a rumor. They said, Chris, you don't understand. Under the Soviets, you didn't discuss Jewish history, period. And then I started to take a look at some of the older cavers I was asking for help. I would leave a things to do list there every year, but nothing was getting done. And then I started to realize something. 
Some of them were old enough to be those young boys described in the Nuremberg transcripts that were seen sh sing on the tops of their father's shoulders in order to get a better view of the bludgeoning of the Jews in the streets of Lvov by pipes. That's why I wasn't getting any help. So in the US, meanwhile, I spent my time in museums, libraries, bookstores, looking in the back of books. I was looking for magic words like Jewish cave survivor, Holocaust cave dweller, nothing. No leads. And then after about nine or 10 years, I was starting to give it up. I was starting to think, well, not all puzzles are solvable. But on the internet, I came across a very sophisticated genealogical website where you could spell names of villages and people phonetically and get records, marriage records, death records, birth records, back to the 1890s from this area. And I realized every day thousands of Jews, if not 10,000s of Jews from all over the world were going to this site. So I got an idea. If this rumor, i.e. that some Jews may have lived in a cave during the Holocaust was true, and if some survived, one day there may be relatives doing research. And if I put the right keywords on my website in Ukrainian caves, perhaps one of them would find a way to me. And then in December 2002, I got an email from a gentleman who identified himself as Ed Vogel, the son-in-law of Saul Wexler, who survived the Holocaust with 37 friends and relatives by living underground for 511 days. And Saul Wexler was living seven miles away from me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started to interview Saul, and he introduced me to his extended family, the Sturmers up in Canada. At that time, there were 15 of the original 38. Sadly, today there's 12. Uh, the interviews were rough. Um, I remember in approaching them, when they, and they weren't, they weren't that willing to really discuss a personal matter to a non-Jew. That was another hurdle. But then I realized when I was going to interview them, it's going to be a little bit of a predicament I was going to be in. Not Jewish. I've had Jewish friends, but I really never knew anyone from the Holocaust. I mean, deeply knew them, what they went through. So I knew I was going to have to look into the eyes of Saul and his relatives, and I was going to have to let them draw me into their world, because I was approaching this as a writer. I wanted to get a, a magazine write, uh, uh, article published in National Geographic with a colleague of mine, Peter Lane Taylor, as the co-writer. And Peter's younger than me, so I told him, I said, you know what? When we sit down with them, and we made nine trips to Montreal, uh, nine hour, 12 hour trips on weekends, I said, uh, let's not take the notebooks out, let's not take the cameras out. Um, we want to make them feel comfortable, and we just kept uh, excusing ourselves and went to the bathroom and making notes on tissue paper. Uh, but I knew all the time, looking in their eyes, the one thing I cannot say is, I know, I understand. So those were hard interviews. And from them, we got a copy of the grandmother's memoirs, We Fight to Survive. She wrote down what happened to them. And we found out that before, four, uh, 38 of them lived in one cave for 344 days, a cave called Priest Grotto. 28 of them lived in another cave called Vitebe for six months. So we had the names and we had the caves. Uh, I approached National Geographic Adventure Magazine and they said, okay, we're gonna send you and Peter over there, but before we print one word of this somewhat fantastic story of yours, we want you to bring back physical evidence that this story took place the way you guys are reporting it. So we were off to uh, Ukraine in July of 2003. Uh, I wanted to speak to the local museum curator and uh, also some of the senior cavers. Interestingly enough, we start to pick up additional information. Here, the curator of museum shown us one of the first maps made of Vitebe in the 1890s, when archaeologists discovered as far back as 2,000 years ago, local villages would survive invading armies by taking refuge in the nearby caves. Every one of the 38 people that lived in the caves I just mentioned learned that fact in elementary school. They knew it could be done. I also wanted to speak to the people that opened up Free Scrotto Cave reopened it after the cave and closed it, and uh, they reopened it in the 1960s. I particularly want to know what the journal entries showed about evidence of people having lived in the cave. So we, uh, Peter and I, we went into Pre Scrotto here and also for Tabor. Uh, we concentrated in an area that the Ukrainian cave is called Hotki, 
It means little cottage because they knew someone lived there, but they didn't know who. We start to find artifacts and piece the story together. Uh, the list of made artifacts we found. And we're working with a local museum to preserve them. And deep in the back of the cave, we found the names of some of the 38, the names of the five families, the names that were mentioned in Esther Sturmer's memoirs, which I didn't have available to 2002. And remember why National Geographic sent us there? Get physical evidence this story took place. If you look closely at the four and three, there are white smudges. That's the result of a natural process where minerals leach out of the rock and cover the surface, a process that takes 60 to 70 years. Whoever wrote 1943 wrote it in the 1940s. Um, they had to deal with bats, and like all living things, bats go to the bathroom, so certain parts of the floor were covered with guano. Uh, how did they eat? Well, in the first cave, three of the group had monies to bribe the local Nazis to let them go around collecting scrap metal with a horse-drawn cart. Once a week, late at night, in the cover of darkness, they brought food to the entrance of the cave. In the second cave, uh, those badges had been taken away, and those three were in as much danger as the rest of the people. Every one of the five families had one male that would go out every five to six weeks, late at night, and dig up maybe beets or potatoes and bring the food back. Uh, they had plenty of water in the second cave. They found their own lake. Um, luckily enough, corner, you know, corner Esther, she said, thank goodness no one got ill because they only had one meal a day. Uh, and finally, put together the story, and what they achieved is they survived both the Holocaust above and the perils below, and they hold the longest recorded historical record of sustained underground survival, even in excess of a French scientist named Sofre who in 1972, while working for National Air Knox and Space Administration, stayed 250 days in a cave in Texas, and they isolated, and they had to remove him when he was hallucinating. Um, and they beat the odds, as you heard one of the survivors say. They beat the odds, and they, they're here. And then we got the magazine article published. The book came out in 2007. And we finally got enough money together in 2010 to take four of the survivors back. Uh, Saul Sturmer here accused me of making him look like an advertisement for Air Ukraine. But uh, <laughs> here he is, 92 years old, with his younger brother, uh, Sam, 86. And here the nieces are on the back row. Uh, the one on the left was four years old in the cave. When she came out after they were liberated, as, after 511 days, Esther Sturmer tells the story in her memoirs how she was crying and every one of them turned their attention towards Lil Seema who was holding her eyes and shielding them and crying, looking directly into the sun and asking someone to blow out the candle. Um, the big day came in 2010. We had a whole system devised of lowering the two brothers, 92-year-old Saul and 86-year-old Sam, down the 30-foot deep shaft that's two and a half feet wide and then they were supposed to be assisted doing a 90-foot crawl and six inches of water. And I knew it wasn't going to work. As it turns out, that wasn't my plan. That was the film crew's plan. But as it worked out, call it fate, call it luck, we got an even better story. Because let's face it, anyone seen the beginning of the story, you're going to think one or two things are going to happen. You think you're going to see two old guys that are extremely happy for getting in a cave, or two old guys that are extremely sad for not getting in a cave. Well, they couldn't get in the cave. They panicked, which was understandable. They came out, the film crew's packing up, the sound crew's packing up, and I, I had been working on this for 20 years. I knew Esther's memoirs from front to back, and I, I went off in the field, and I refused to believe this was the end of the story, and I started to ask myself, why did Esther write the memoirs? And just as I remembered, the granddaughter of Saul, pictured here on her left, came to me with the grandson of Saul's brother, and they said, please talk to our grandfathers. They said, the cave's too dangerous, and they're not going to let you take me in. And I remembered why Esther wrote the book. I called to the guy from the History Channel with the camera. I felt like a little kid under the Christmas tree, Christmas Eve, and I said, get your camera, follow me, follow me, follow me. I put both grandchildren on the side of Saul Sturmer, and I looked him in the eye and said, why did your mother write her memoirs? And he smiled and quoted her verbatim. 
so the grandchildren can learn the story and take it to future, tell to future generations. And we took the grandchildren in. And now they're part of a project telling it to future generations. So ironically, Esther Sturmer in 1960 wrote the end of a documentary we finished making in 2013, and none of us saw it. I actually came back from this trip believing someone, something I've mocked my whole life. Some things may be preordained, or maybe fate, and what has it meant to me? I told you, I've had to look into the eyes of the people I've told you about, and I had to let them draw me into their world. When I was growing up, I heard about the evils of, of American slavery. I heard about the atrocities committed against the Native Americans. And I heard about the number six million, the estimated number to have perished in the Nazi death camps. But I'll be honest, at that time, whether it was five million, six million, or seven million, simply a large number. I hate to quote somebody like Joseph Stalin, but he once said, the loss of an individual is always a personal tragedy. Thank goodness the loss of millions is nothing more than a mere statistic. After having looked into the eyes of the survivors of this experience and being drawn into their lives for over 10 years now through numerous interviews, I finally learned something. Holocaust was never one individual story how six million people perished. Six million individual stories how brothers, sons, mothers, fathers, lovers, classmates, and friends perished, as are all such genocides. Thank you.